The scripture reading today is Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your, your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Before the service, I'm sitting in my seat at church. One or more people are talking to me. The music is playing. The minister is walking in. There's lots of socializing happening. Several people are wearing strong perfume. There's loud noise from the heating system, unpleasant colored electric light, and I'm sitting there unable to filter out sensory information that I don't need and feeling increasingly tense. By the time the minister starts, I'm not capable of paying attention, and it takes a while to be able to calm down and focus. So there is a lot of hard work for me to do before I can even start to join in with a worship service. During the service, I find it difficult to concentrate because of distractions. The distractors are normal things that aren't bad in themselves, but I'm unable to filter them out. This takes a lot of effort, and it's stressful because I don't want to miss anything. This is normal for me, and many everyday situations are just exhausting. I enjoy the social time following the service, but making the switch from concentration to social interaction is difficult. It takes time to adjust and can leave me feeling numb on the outside, hoping that the friendly person in front of me won't think I'm not interested and go away before I've been able to tune into what they're saying and find the words to reply. So writes Catherine Bale, diagnosed with two types of what we call today neurodiversity, inherent neurological ways of processing the world that are different from others with neurotypical brains. Like so many in this community, Catherine's diagnoses, autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, came later in life after years of suffering and stigma. Why am I so different from everyone else? Why can't I engage in small talk? Why do I take everything so literally? Why can't I make eye contact with others? Why do I hyper-focus on specific problems or interests? Why, oh, why am I such a perfectionist? Why can't I read my environment like everyone else? 
Why am I so stubborn about my likes and dislikes descending into a rage when I'm not understood? Why can't I just go with the flow? Why am I the odd, quirky, or downright weird kid at school? Why are my parents always yelling at me? Why do I fidget, rock, or do other repetitive things when things feel overwhelming? And why does everything feel so overwhelming? Why is everything too loud, too bright, too strong-smelling, too chaotic, too everything? What neurodivergent persons do know is that who they really are must be kept a secret at any cost, even from God, if it comes to that. For who would love them if they knew how different they really are? Massively creative and intelligent, ND individuals can spend whole lifetimes in the shadows, hidden from view, coping with or avoiding a world they must lie to live in. Now, according to the CDC, one in every 42 boys and one in every 189 girls in the U.S. are born with a type of neurodiversity. ASD, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, etc. Between 2000 and 2018, the percentage of eight-year-olds diagnosed with autism increased 150%. By the age of 25, as many as 50,000 neurodiverse children per year age out of the support systems that help them to adjust to a neurotypical world. In recent years, due to the lack of diagnosis early in life, a large percentage of adults are now being diagnosed as neurodiverse. Today, 56 million people, or 17% of the US population, are considered neurodivergent. In a remarkable leap of insight, many corporations, especially in the tech sector, are now appreciating the immense gifts neurodiverse individuals bring to the workplace. With special skills in pattern recognition and memory or mathematics, neurodiverse persons often lead the way in solving the most complex problems of our time. The question for us though, today, is where is the church in all this evolution? How are faith communities extending a radical welcome to the neurodivergent among us, those seeking safety and affirmation? How are we at the UCC doing as far as creating an environment that supports our neurodiverse children and friends? How can God's love help heal those who feel judged and vulnerable and rejected or ignored? And how can we, you and I, be that source of love in their lives? Now, I'm going to confess to you today, this issue is personal for me. For most of my childhood and young adult life, I counted myself among the odd. Not that you'd ever know it, of course. I hid things very well, as neurodivergent kids do. Yet I had a radically impulsive nature, often dragging friends off into very risky adventures. I could perseverate for hours on tasks that made no sense to anyone else. And sometime you can ask me about the summer I collected eraser dust. I had a fearsome imagination. I hated transitions of any kind and often felt lonely and out of sync in social situations. 
To my mother's chagrin, I reliably brought home stellar report cards with C's and D's in behavior. It wasn't until I had a child with ADHD and now two grandchildren with ADHD that I can appreciate my own struggles as well as the immense gifts this form of neurodiversity can bring. As we consider our role as a church living into our commitment to be open and affirming of all, I think it's powerful to consider Jesus' words to his disciples on that mountaintop in Matthew's gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for a right relationship with God, for they will be filled. But the fact is, and you know it, the world is not kind or comforting for those who seem different. Those who fall on the tails of that infernal bell curve we all seem obsessed with. Indeed, the, sur the suicide rate for neurodiverse individuals is 10 times higher than the average. How can we, as a congregation, be merciful? How can we bring peace into a neurodivergent person's life? Well, this is only the beginning of a longer and a larger conversation. However, here are some simple things to consider to get us started. Is our physical environment comfortable for people with sensory issues? Natural lighting is preferable, and thank goodness we have plenty of that. Yet flickering lights, loose connections, or excessively bright spots can be difficult, especially if they occur near somebody who's speaking so your focus is drawn to do things simultaneously. And how about sound? Is the quality clear and not too loud? Thanks to Mark it is. Is there any buzzing or feedback? Are heating systems or fans excessively noisy? Now we don't happen to have flashing lights and rock bands, but if we did, that could present a real overload for somebody who is neurodiverse? Is there a quiet space somewhere with sen for someone with sensory overload, a place where they can retreat to if necessary, even for a little break? And is that information known? Smells can also be problematic. Are people encouraged not to wear perfume? What about strong cleaning products or dampness? And how about greeting people? I know that we welcome everyone warmly, but do we welcome them consciously? We are a hugging church, even with the pandemic. Yet are we respectful of the physical boundaries of others? If someone is uncomfortable with eye contact or small talk, do we assume that person is rude or unfriendly? Or can we appreciate that attending church may be the hardest thing that person will do all day? Keep the live stream and the Zoom options coming. They are wonderful and safe alternatives for those who aren't ready for an in-person experience. Finally, make sure small groups are available where neurodivergent persons can navigate and contribute more comfortably. I love that our study and mission groups allow for this kind of interaction. And I also love that our East Room Gallery provides a quieter place to socialize after worship. Of course, the list goes on. Indeed, I've included some further items on a handout that is available over by the piano uh, where you can pick it up after worship. 
My friends, on this Mental Health Sunday, let us remember in Emily Dickinson's words, I am out with lanterns looking for myself. Aren't we all out looking for ourselves? Remember, our task is to be children of the God who made us neuro-precious in our own ways and ever here to love one another.